if it's not one thing it's another hi guys this is connie and i'm back to read another chapter of connie reads max the mighty we are on chapter four you know who the next day i'm hanging around the park it's not much of a park J just this sloping down grass place by the old mill pond with a statue of a guy on a horse some civil war general and he's pointing his sword at the pond like he's going to chase the ducks away. The whole statue is this rusted green color, except for his hat, which is white, where the birds are always crapping on it. I'm sitting on this bench by the edge of the pond, tossing pebbles into the water and thinking it's a good thing it's Saturday because it's way too nice for school. Sometimes I like to stare at the way the sun glitters on the water. These jagged bits of light that float like diamonds or something. And if you look at it long enough, you sort of, uh, you feel sort of hypnotized. Like somebody cast a spell, or somebody has cast a spell, and when you wake up, the world will be changed into a better place. So I'm sitting there kind of zoned, and not really thinking about anything, when a familiar voice says, I heard they call you Freak the Mighty. I look around, and there she is, the bookworm sitting on the bench, staring at me with these really intense green eyes. Eyes so hot and bright you can almost feel the heat. Freak the Mighty was two people, I tell her. Kevin and me. Who's Kevin? she asked. And so I tell her about my best friend Kevin Avery, a three-foot-high kid with a brain like Einstein, and how the other kids called him Freak because he had leg braces and this crummy disease that meant he couldn't grow. How I used to act so dumb that everyone, including me, thought I didn't have a brain until Kevin showed me how to think, and how the two of us became Freak the Mighty, and went on a lot of cool adventures, slaying dragons and fools and walking high above the world. Cool, she says. So where is he now, your little friend Kevin? Did he move away or something? I don't really want to talk about it, but there's something about the way Worm listens that make it, makes it okay. He died, I tell her last year. She just sits there for a while thinking about it. Then she goes, what a crummy deal. Yeah, I said, it was. So she goes, now you're Max the Mighty. For some reason, that makes my ears burn hot. I'm just Max, I tell her, just plain Max. Worm has this sort of smile on her face, like she knows a secret about me. And she's about to say what it is when a worried voice calls out, Rachel, leave the nice man alone. I turn and see this woman perched on a bench nearby. She looks real nervous, like she's going to leap up at any second and scream for the cops. Like because I'm big and goofy looking, I might be a pervert or something. Before, But before I get really steamed up, I notice the woman looks familiar. She looks a lot like Worm, only older and sadder. Rachel, the woman says. Worm goes, it's okay, Mom. He's from school. The woman gets up from the bench and comes over. She's wearing this long, old-fashioned black dress, and she's got this stiff-legged way of walking, like her feet are hurting, and she doesn't want them to touch the ground. When she gets closer, I notice these dark bruises under her eyes, and right away I know there's something scaring her, and it's not just me. I'm sorry, sir, she says in a low, sweet voice that's even sadder than her eyes. I thought you were a stranger. She's calling me sir like I'm a grown-up, and that makes me feel a little weird. I sort of like it and don't like it at the same time. The trouble with looking like a grown-up is the older I get, the more I look like my father. Looking like my father is okay unless dear old dad happens to be Killer Kane and he's in prison for murdering your mother, which means people look at me and think maybe I'll grow up to be just like him, or worse. Worm goes, We'll be safe here, Mom. She thinks because... I got the gangbanger to leave her alone. I can make her safe all the time. What a joke. If she knew what a sap sucker I really am, she'd get a head start and never start running or never stop running. Safe, I ask. Safe from what? Never mind that, Rachel, her mom says. We mustn't involve this young man in our troubles. But her mom sits down too. The three of us together on a bench like we're waiting for a bus. Which is sort of strange. But okay. It's quiet for a while and then Worm pipes up. You know what that pond reminds me of? 
The Wind in the Willows. Remember how Daddy used to read me that story? I remember, her mom says, kind of wistful. Worm roots around inside her backpack until she finds a dog-eared copy of the book. She flips through the pages, but you can tell she's practically got the thing memorized. She's read it so many times. Remember how Mole, the Badger, and Rat like to row around in their little boat? And Mr. Toad is always acting so grand and getting into trouble. Her voice is going higher, like talking about the story is making her feel like a little kid again. She turns to me and says, Remember? Um, not exactly, I say. You never read Wind in the Willows? I go, um, I saw the cartoon version on TV. Which sounds so lame having to admit you've never read a really famous book. I'm expecting word Worm to give me a hard time, but she doesn't. Instead, she says, we don't, we don't even have a TV. You know who won't let us. Huh? I say, my creepy stepfather. He hates TV even more than he hates books. My real dad loves TV and books. Rachel, her mom says like a warning. Well, he does, Worm insists. My real dad is always sending me stuff to read. He calls me his little bookworm. Her mom stands up and takes a deep breath. Come along, she says, taking Worm by the hand. We have to keep moving. I'm wondering why they have to keep moving when suddenly this old black station wagon stretches to a halt in the street behind us. No, not a station wagon exactly. It's an old Cadillac hearse. Hearse. Kind of like a... Uh, the kind that isn't used for funerals anymore. The motor is smoking and dripping streaks of rust make it look like the hearse is bleeding from the inside. Suddenly the door flies open and out pops this tall skinny dude with a flopping black hat and long black coat and black shoes. Everything black. It's the Undertaker and he's coming to get us. Ooh, well, That was the end of that chapter. And I'll see you in the next chapter. Be careful with that and enjoy. Please and thank you.